Hi, my name is John Downing. I am the author of this set of lessons in limnology and aquatic ecology, and I am a limnologist and an aquatic ecologist. This session is going to be on zooplankton, zooplankton of fresh waters or inland waters. And um, there may be a few things that you already know about zooplankton that you can um, start with. You probably have heard of things called krill in the ocean. These um, are the amazingly small food for filter feeding whales. Krill is marine zooplankton. We have things in fresh waters that are very much like krill also. You already may know that in the biosphere, if there's food to eat, something eats it. So there's plankton algae that we've just looked at in the previous session. Somebody's got to eat it. And that's got to be some kind of planktonic organism, and therefore a zooplankton. If you fish, you know that fish eat something out there, right? You know that their food must exist. But have you thought about what it is? A lot of it's zooplankton. Some of it's benthos, but we'll get to that in session 15. If you have an aquarium, you may feed your fish Daphnia or amphipods. Both of these can be zooplankton. Daphnia is almost always a zooplanktonic organism, and amphipods show up in the plankton. Both of these are zooplanktonic organisms, and there are lots of other representatives. And you know that the zooplankton must be quite abundant because whales in the sea, very large organisms indeed, grow and live well eating zooplankton. So the objectives that I have for this session are quite straightforward. First, I want you to learn the four major groups of zooplankters in uh, inland water systems, and then we'll talk about a few others too. I'd like you to learn about biodiversity in the zooplankton and what they do. I'd like to explore their trophic ecology. What's trophic ecology anyhow? Trophic ecology is what they eat, who eats them, how much gets eaten, and how they go about doing it. I'd also like you to learn about temporal population cycles because these are important to understand in order to uh, comprehend really why they're, um, uh, when f food is available for other kinds of organisms in um, freshwater systems. And we'll talk about seasonal um, t population cycles as well as daily cycles. I'd like you to also learn about changes in body shape that we see that are quite interesting. And, um, and diagnostic and tell us a lot about life in planktonic systems. So first, who are the components of the zooplankton? Well, there are four major ones. They're the cladocera, the copepods, the rotifers, and the ciliates. Four major groups. You may have heard of things called water fleas. These aren't fleas at all. They're perfectly good little crustaceans that uh, live, and many, many if not most are, in fact, herbivorous. and form a very important link uh, between food resources and upper, um, uh, upper trophic levels. So they aren't fleas, but they are cladocera. Uh, there are copepods, very common in marine and freshwater systems. And there are littler things called rotifers, and even smaller things called ciliates. And then we can talk uh, briefly about a couple of other kinds of things, like the amphipods and mycids, which are pretty big, sort of shrimpy sorts of things. And um, we'll also talk about insect larvae that show up in the plankton, as well as fish larvae, too. First, let's talk about um, cladocera, or the so-called water fleas. These are primarily filter feeders. In fact, I'll run this video here, and you can kind of see what they look like in action. You see the little heart there, but also the appendages on the lower part of the animal, um, down toward the bottom of the picture, are actually their filter feeding appendages. And they feed quite selectively on smallish particles. Things, oh, normally less than about 40 microns, which is something like, um, you know, a quarter uh, the thickness of a sheet of paper would be a really big food particle for these things. Um, some of these, some of the cladocera are predaceous, things like Polyphemus and Leptodora. And they're quite remarkable to look at, and they're very voracious predators, but most of the cladocera are herbivores. They reprodu reproduce parthenogenically, and um, they, um, meaning that the females simply reproduce themselves over and over again until, um, under certain conditions, uh, males are produced, and then sexual reproduction occurs, resulting in resting eggs that are called Ephippia, and they're called Ephippia because they look like saddles, and these Ephippia will overwinter in the sediments or get through 
tough periods of time um, uh, and then hatch back out. Some of the important genera you've heard about might be Daphnia, Bosmina, Chidorus, and other things like that. They're quite remarkable. Let's look at the image over here. We've got filter, filtering appendages, um, some big, um, uh, some some big uh, uh, appendages that stick out and move around a lot. Not in this particular one because it seems to be immobilized. An eye spot. This is the digest, di, jaw, uh, sort of jaws. Mandibles are in here, and the food is collected with these appendages, moved in here, pushed into the gut, and moves through the gut. What you see up here are actually eggs, um, uh, and they'll form many eggs. And the um, eggs develop completely into juveniles within the carapace of the female, and then they're ejected. Very interesting animals. Now here's another group of organisms that are very important. These are the copepods. And um, now, they're in, if you're interested in marine ecosystems, there just aren't that many cladocera in marine systems, but there are lots of copepods. And there are three main groups of copepods. They're the calanoids shown at top, and you can tell they're calanoids because they have great big, um, great big antennae sticking out. There are the cyclopoids, and they're um, the over picture middle right here is a cyclopoid and a scanning electron micrograph. You can get some idea of the size here. These are their antennae. They're rather short usually, and they have sort of grasping mouth parts and uh, thoracic appendages here. And then the third kind are the har harpacticoids, and these are shown down here. And you'll notice that they have a much more sort of cylindrical body, not quite so tapered compared to this uh, cyclopoid, and they have short, uh, shortish antennae. Now the calanoids are herbivores, and they um, they use uh, the antennae and mouth parts to create vortices that move particles of, of water, uh, packets of water, and particles toward the mouth. Important to remember that because these are very small organisms, th um, that means that the water to them is rather viscous. It's uh, much more like swimming. You would be swimming in say um, semi-set jello than in water, much more viscous. And so they're moving sort of packets of water and the particles in them and removing the uh, particles from those packets of water. The cyclopoids, a lot of them are predators and they'll feed on small zooplankton. Some um, her, uh, species are herbivorous and I've seen them selectively graze on phytoplankton or um, attached algae with these grasping appendages that you see right, see right in here. So they'll um, actually hang on to um, food particles, and many of the species are pred predaceous, um, but um, you can't really generalize. A lot of the cyclopoids are, in fact, herbivores or detrit detritivorous, eating detrital material. Finally, at the bottom, the harpacticoids are mostly littoral and sediment dwellers, littoral zone and sediment dwellers, and they have seizing and scraping mouth parts up in here. And um, their uh, uh, the, and these are actually, if you'll be, if you look at samples of benthic organisms or plankton in the littoral zone, you'll find these things, and they'll be bright blue in color. A lot of them, bluish green colors, quite quite beautiful. Um, but they're more oriented toward substrata than they are toward um, a planktonic existence. Um, feeding in these organisms can be highly selective, enough to allow many uh, species to coexist. Um, uh, even though they may appear to be highly similar. The third group, oh wait, before we get on to the third group, let's look at a little bit of video so you get some sense of how these things work. Here's a, a calanoid copepod over on the left hand side and uh, we'll run this and you notice they move their appendages and a, a very quickly and they're picking up uh, particles, often missing particles, um, of um, various plankton um, and so you can see how they're just processing the water uh, very fast. Um, you may also notice that uh, this is a female and she's bearing a large number of copepod eggs. Um, they will carry those around basically in sort of their t tail area. That's how that, that one does what it does. And now in the middle uh, image here, this is a cyclopoid copepod and um, this is an Im uh, some images. Uh, these are images done by a friend of mine named Rudy Strickler. And uh, Rudy has uh, tethers um, um, a lot of these organisms on things like horse hairs and stuff, and so that they don't move around too much. So this is a tether here, and here's the animal, and it's sort of its um, 
its tail and so on, but you can see it attempting to feed. This is a, a cyclopoid copepod, and they'll hop and hop along through the water um, using those appendages and the sort of snapping motion, and will um, seek particles as they come by. And you'll see the sort of the current of water moving past, and um, those appendages are used then to pick up those particles and move them uh, into the animal and into the gut. Finally, this is a, um, a little video of a harpactacoid copepod, and notice that it wiggles around a lot more. This is a female also. Look at the large number of eggs. Sort of wiggles and crawls around and scrapes particles off of surfaces. So those are the three kinds of copepods. Next, let's have a look at the rotifers. Now, these are a little bit smaller, and some of the rotifers can be almost um, as small as uh, food particles for some of the larger zooplankton. So um, they are quite tiny things. And um, the rotifers are primarily herbivores, and they use a circle of cilia called a corona or crown to create a current. And they're called the rotifers or wheel organisms because they look very much like um, as they move, as if they have a wheel spinning um, or in this sort of corona. And, and here's some video of that, and you can sort of see the spinning currents it's making with those food particles spinning around. Um, and here we're seeing it, this particular species is attached with a sort of a stalk. And, um, and here we have the sort of the mouth parts in here and the gut. Let's see if it catches anybody. If we watch long enough, maybe it will. Now there's some smallish particles coming in. And generally, these will feed on pretty, pretty tiny particles, um, smaller than would be eaten normally by, say, um, a, a clodocerin. And there we have sort of gut peristalsis and movement of material within this um, Brachionis uh, uh, rotifer. Uh, next, let's look at, um, well, some species also are uh, predaceous, and we'll look at one of uh, those in just a second. But some species are attached to the substrate with a stalk, like you saw. But uh, and most, um, but many rotifers are littoral zone dwellers, and but there are uh, something like a hundred plus species that are planktonic, and we'll just see really a lot of these in uh, samples of plankton. A few important species are predators. Um, and uh, I'm going to show you some video of Asplankna, which is an important predator. It's basically a giant predator bag, and it goes around trying to engulf um, uh, various particles. And you'll see this one at work here. Here's uh, Asplankna coming up on this video. See a very large sort of bag with some differentiated parts within, but you'll notice that it leaps out with sort of a snapping motion and picks up um, maybe ciliates or various protozoa that would be smaller than it, than it is. Not much organization on the inside, but they do take in material. They collect the, they're, like I say, they're like a great big predator bag going around and engulfing things. It'll let it go on its merry, predacious way. Um, and so, um, and these are herbivores, and they consume uh, mostly small size cells. I'm sorry, the herbivores are uh, will take in pretty small cells, mostly less than about 12 microns, and they're very important constituents of the plankton, but often have been ignored in the past because of their small size. There's one other one I wanted to show you down here. Um, some of them are. Um, uh, some of them are parasites on other organisms. So you see a cyclopoid copepod here. You should be able to uh, d distinguish its body form here. It's short antennae. But down here are a bunch of parasitic uh, rotifers. And um, the image is a little bit small in this uh, projection here. But um, you can see the rotifers are busy doing various things down there. Uh, but um, quite parasitic on these um, on copepods. And, you see them parasitic attached. You'll see rotifers attached uh, to copepod, uh, sorry, clodocera that are almost the same size as a clodocera, and they um, 
uh, this I think this road of hers, this sorry, this uh, copepod is having a bit of a tough go of it because of all these parasites, quite a large number of them. Next, let's talk about ciliates and protozoa, and these are also important. Um, they're found in almost all habitats, and they're often very small. So what we're seeing here is going on at a, a very small size. Some of them are big, of course, but um, most of them are in the sort of the range of a couple of microns. Some are, are, are big. Um, they're a little studied because they're difficult to preserve and identify. For years, people thought there weren't very many of them out there, but it turns out that the um, that the preservatives people were using was causing them to explode um, and um, so that you could really not identify them as organisms. They feed on all kinds of things. They feed on detritus, on bacteria, fungi, yeast, algae, and in fact they'll feed on other protozoa. Some are parasitic on algae, um, parasitic on algae or other zooplankton, while others are uh, eat dead material. And um, I found entire um, freshwater mussels, and we'll talk about those a little bit in a subsequent session. I've I've I found mussels dying basically because they're being eaten by the from the inside out by uh, various uh, ciliates and other protozoa. So let's have a look at one. Here's a scanning EM of a uh, paramecium, and and we'll watch this paramecium um, a paramecium feed. So you can see it's got this uh, place where food can come in and it's forming globs of food as it pulls it in with its cilia. And you can tell from the image uh, on the left that the hole outside of this um, organism is covered in cilia, moving water and particles. Now watch, um, we'll sort of bud off uh, yet another um, um, collection of material and start in on a new one. Here we go. Start a new one. Oops, another paramecium coming in and smashing into this one. Um, and it goes on collecting particles. Now, some of these, as I mentioned, are, um, are voracious predators. And one of those predators is didinium. And this is didinium down here um, to the uh, sort of mid right in this image. And uh, down here is a little video of didinium here and a paramecium here. And this didinium is just about going to eat that paramecium. Um, it's eating a, an organism um, as big or bigger than itself. And, and please don't be appalled by this, but it's quite surprising. It's attached to the paramecium. It's hauling it in and simply engulfs it. It's like a nightmare, isn't it? Quite, quite a remarkable thing. Uh, a, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of violence that goes on in the microscopic world. Now, the other three groups that I said maybe aren't always there or sometimes there, but are pretty important too, are the sort of shrimp-like uh, invertebrates. And that would include um, mysis or mysids uh, to the upper right. Now, these can be pretty big sorts of things. And then amphipoda. And those, these you can see with the naked eye. The mysids are called the opossum shrimp um, they, um, because of the way they brood young. They're deep benthic dwellers, and um, they mostly inhabit oligotrophic or fairly clean, clear water lakes. Their length can be up to three centimeters. So um, for those of you who don't do metric system, that's about like that. It's something like um, a little bit more than an um, little bit more than an inch. These are favorite foods of things like um, uh, trout and so on in the deep waters. Um, they they will eat small zooplankton. They also eat phytoplankton. And they'll eat detrital material, quite a, a fantastically large and important uh, planktonic organism. Um, they can be really important predators even on Daphnia or Daphnia juveniles. Their a, a reproduction is normally in winter, um, less than 40 eggs, and then the juveniles are retained in a marsupium, and that's why they're called opossum shrimp. Um, now, over to the right on the bottom, the b bottom two images are amphipods, which you may have heard of um, as scuds, as sort of their common name. These often um, live around the edges of the littoral zone, so they'll be part of the plankton um, when they wander out into open water. Um, and uh, they can be several millimeters in length, and um, so they're, they're not as big as the missids, but they're uh, pretty large, can be pretty large things, and they just zip around um, in the um, at, a, at an amazing speed, um, and um, they eat bacteria, algae, fungi, animal and plant remains, 
um, vegetation and detritus. Some you may have heard of are called Pontoporia and Hyalella. These are important genera. And over here is a video just to give you a sense of how they move. You can see very fast uh, action of, of the thoracic appendages, um, enough to move particles and do its day-to-day um, -day business and move around quite, quite effectively. Very kind of shrimp-like as this video sort of follows it, kind of crayfish or lobster-like in the, the motion that they have, a flipping of that sort of tail and uh, using of the thoracic appendages to move particles. And you can see it's got this one spinning pretty well. Finally, we should well we should talk about insect larvae and then um, uh, the final group. Uh, insect larvae, the ones we find in the plankton, are usually things like phantom midges, um, and you can see one over to the right, and you can see in a way why it's called a phantom, um, because it's kind of clear and it has a dark eye spot and a couple of other markings on them. These are um, sometimes these are found in the in the plankton as they migrate up and down the water column. And um, they, these things, uh, the, the chaoborids, um, usually migrate in and out of the plankton from the sediments. They can be really important predators or sources of food for pelagic predators too. So, um, and they, um, and in fact, this thing up here is a jaw, and they are pretty voracious predators. And we'll um, sort of watch a little bit of video of one here as it moves in in the open water. Not really scintillating video, is it? But what they'll do is they'll move, yeah, they'll move sporadically, not really frequently, and it's almost a fish-like motion. But you see, it's its head there with its large jaw, and it can grab a hold of food. And um, you can see by the contents of the gut that it's had some luck at bringing in food. Final uh, final group of plankton to talk about are the fish larvae, and these um, are important components of the plankton at various times of the year. Um, in, and they will feed on, um, well, as soon as they absorb the yolk sac and, and need food, they'll feed on ciliates and small zooplankton. Um, they can also be very important prey for aquatic predators, including fish and various invertebrates. Um, but it's very critical that um, there's abundant food available for these fish larvae in the plankton when they become planktonic and lose their yolk sac. Uh, um, they are um, pelagic um, larvae are, are present in lake and river dwelling fish, things like sunfishes or the centrarchids, the pike perches, walleye and sauger and so on, and the whitefishes who are the cor coragonids. And they, these all will have pelagic um, sort of zooplanktonic fish larvae. The pretty critical period concept, and one that's quite familiar to those of you who are uh, interested in fisheries, is that the larval development is very short and occurs at various times of the year and it's critical that there be food available when they need it. The image there are, is of a yellow perch larvae. Next I'd like to talk about the feeding of herbivorous zooplankton because it can be so important. We'll talk about the feeding process, we'll talk briefly about food selectivity um, inc including particle size and particle type, and then talk a bit about feeding rates, and hopefully you'll be impressed with how fast these organisms can feed. The, fil the filter feeding process is uh, quite, quite straightforward, and I showed you this, um, uh, this kind of animal. This is a Daphnia-type animal, a, a Clodocerin. But basically what happens is that the limbs, um, these limbs down here form a current uh, and they collect particles into a box uh, some uh, in front of the fifth thoracic appendage, so down in, down in this area here. And then um, as the limbs close in, the particles are retained, in fact, by overlapping CT, almost making a filter by crossing, crossing their limbs. The food uh, is formed up into a bolus or a big ball, then which is passed forward along the, the groove, the food groove here, back up to the mouth and there's a groove between these appendages and they're bilaterally symmetrical so they've got a set on either side. The gut can be filled and emptied in as little as a minute. They move extremely fast and can filter a huge amount of material out of the water in a very short time. Um, here's a Daphnia feeding and again you see those thoracic appendages 
uh, beating along. You see food that's been taken in, food boluses that have been brought into the gut. And um, let's just watch this for a little while. Uh, they really can go very fast and take particles out, cr uh, move, uh, put them in a food bolus, and uh, which will be formed up in this area, brought in through the mandibles, and then put into the gut. Here you see some food here that's been collected. The foregut going back into the uh, going back into the overall gut. Now, we have to learn a, the distinction between a couple of things. One is the filtering rate, and the other is the feeding rate. And these are quite easy to distinguish. Feeding rate is like how much food do you eat, right? This is the ingestion rate. It's the actual amount of food ingested per unit time. And it's often calculated um, uh, using the filtering rate. The filtering rate is the volume of water cleared of particles of a given type per unit of time. And this is often measured in things like milliliters per animal per day, which gives you some sense that these very tiny organisms can process a lot of water very fast. And the reason we measure these filtering rates is we often measure it using tracer particles, radioactive tracers, or some kind of marker that we allow the animal to take up. And we know how what the specific activity or how much radioactivity there is per unit particle and that tells us then how much mass, how much volume of the water um, the wa animal has cleared per unit time. The feeding rate is um, usually calculated as the product of the volume cleared times S which is the concentration of particles in the water. So they're very different kinds of measurements but they are related uh, by the intermediary, uh, intermediary of the food concentration in the ambient environment. Now, we might ask ourselves how much food zooplankton filter? How much water are they able to clear of particles per day? And this is from uh, an ancient uh, publication of mine uh, with a, a friend who is co-worker of mine. Here's the dry body mass. Now, these are pretty small because even this huge body mass up here is about 5,000 organisms per pound. So they're very, very small. This number over here is the filtering rate in milliliters per animal per day. And this is on a logarithmic scale. This is a liter per day. And for those of you who don't do metric system, um, a liter is about a quart. And so those animals of that size are filter clearing all the particles out of about a quart of water every day. These are very tiny animals, and they're processing a lot of material. So, um, this, so uh, a feeding rate. Um, so, if we would put a, a a a human sort of on this kind of scale, if humans could process material at the same rate that zooplankton do, and we scale this up with body size, it's equivalent to a human drinking. 120,000 liters of water every day, or 120 cubic meters. Cubic meter is a cubic yard. It's a phenomenal amount of processing for a tiny organism. Um, and so they can process a terrific amount of material. Now the feeding rate, this is how the filtering rate, the feeding rate varies with food concentration. Um, and so the more, um, so the more um, food there is in the environment, usually the lower um, the lower the volume of water cleared per unit time but the um, ingestion rate tends to increase with food concentration it often uh, varies also with particle size and often in a polynomial polynomial kind of way so there's sort of some kind of optimal food particle size it also increases with temperature because these are poikilotherms um, they um, react uh, very rapidly to temperature, and it also can um, uh, the uh, volumetric feeding rate uh, and the ingestion rate um, varies with crowding. So they're they're um, they react 
uh, uh, in changing their feeding rate if they tend to be very crowded or being interfered with by other organisms. It tends to drive their filtering rate down and their ingestion rate down. This is what seasonal variation in zooplankton filter feeding looks like. And um, uh, this is from some work by Jim Haney from a very long time ago from Heart Lake, Ontario. And Jim um, estimated the um, grazing rate as a percentage of the entire lake per day. And I think what you can see pretty clearly here is certain times of the day, midsummer, these zooplankton, these little tiny zooplankton, are filter, filtering out 300. 300 percent, three times, they're filtering the entire lake three times every day. And you can imagine that they're clearing that lake pretty rapidly. So they have a tendency to be able to keep waters clear of particles if they're filtering at very high rates. And this, these are just the depth distributions of where the big globs or the, you know, the high rates of filtration occur. Um, and these are, again, as percentage of the water column uh, a percentage of the volume filtered per day. And, um, you know, these are often at intermediate depths, not at the surface, somewhere above the thermocline in the upper mix zone where there's lots of food. And then you see that in late, um, uh, in cooler periods of time, um, they um, tend to filter only a small fraction, or maybe 20% or less of the water column per day. But it's still a pretty phenomenal rate when you consider that these are very tiny organisms. So um, here's, an, here's a, a distribution of the f uh, filtering, uh, the liter a literature review of how much of a lake is filtered each day by zooplankton. And as I mentioned in the last, looking at the last image, um, you know, some of them, uh, some, of, some lakes have a phenomenal amount of filter feeding. Um, more of the observations fall down in the lower range, but still um, in tens, uh, in substantial percentage of the lake filtered uh, every day. This is how food selectivity varies um, in zooplankton, and these would be in Daphnia cuculata uh, from Poland, but just to give you a sense of what size of particles they feed on, this is from 0 to 30, and this is the grazing rate um, and sort of uh, um, some measurement of food selectivity. Different times of the year the zooplankton um, uh, have different food selectivities, but generally in the smaller range of particles beneath 30 microns in size and some so optima in the range of 5 to 10. Um, 30 micron, microns is maybe a quarter of the thickness of a piece of paper and um, 5 microns maybe 1 20th the thickness of a piece of paper. So very tiny particles uh, is what these organisms feed on. Body size also influences particle size. Um, big organisms tend to eat bigger particles. And this is from some old work by Carolyn Burns. But um, here we have the carapace length in millimeters up to a giant um, cladocerin of three millimeters in length, um, which is quite a tiny thing, uh, barely visible to your eye. But over on the y-axis, you see the l diameter of the largest uh, part of food particle ingested. And although uh, the Daphnia cuculata was down sort of in this range in doing its filtering, the very large zooplankton tend to take even much larger particles um, in, uh, uh, into their gut and ingest, and digest them. There are others fa other factors that influence particle selectivity. Um, you know, shape and protective devices can be important, and we discussed that a little bit when we were talking about the dinoflagellates and so on that have great long appendages. Also, there are certain kinds of phytoplankton that are, are of off flavors or maybe even toxic. Things like the cyanobacteria tend to be selected against. And another really interesting aspect of, of what organisms um, of what these uh, planktonic organisms eat, there are some algae that can be filtered in, put in the gut, and passed through the gut, and then passed out the other side as feces that um, remain viable. And the suggestion is that these um, cells actually are taking up nutrients from the gut of the, um, they're allowing themselves to be eaten, and thereby are passing through the gut, absorbing excess nutrients from the zooplankton. 
Seasonal variation arises from simple population dynamics, and you should learn something about how this works. And here I'm relying sort of on um, uh, in, um, a concept sort of based on uh, the temperate zone, where we have a, a, an increase in abundance of zooplankton, oftentimes in the springtime, and then um, again the, a, um, a decline uh, in the wintertime. But this is basic uh, population dynamics, and you can look this up in any ecology book if you don't understand it. But on the, the top equation is the sort of standard um, um, standard equation for population growth. And uh, N sub T is a population after T units of time. N sub O is the current population at this time when this uh, bout of population growth uh, begins. E is the base of the natural logs, and R is the instantaneous rate of population growth. Now, the second equation down simply says that the that rate of population is the difference between the instantaneous birth rate and the instantaneous death rate. And that's pretty straightforward because if birth is greater than death, then R is positive. If death is greater than birth, then R is negative and the population is declining. Instantaneous population growth is a difference between birth and death. Therefore, anything that influences B or D, birth or death, will influence population growth and zooplankton abundance. Big B is the finite growth rate of birth, and it can be calculated pretty easily for things like Cladocera as, uh, um, as the number of eggs held by a population of females divided by the development time in days. And that'll tell you what the finite rate of growth is. And then you can use that as a means of estimating the uh, instantaneous um, birth rate uh, uh, using the equation on the bottom. Bottom line here is that we're going to look at variations in birth and death with food concentration because uh, food concentration obviously is important. Now, if you notice the overall rate of population increase, and this is for different kinds of food sources, so we can kind of ignore that. We'll just look at the shape of these curves. As we increase food concentration, obviously the rate of population increase uh, increases. Now, how does this occur, this uh, R? R is actually B minus D. So here's the birth rate in this middle panel. Birth rate tends to increase with food concentration, and death rate tends to decline. So there's less sort of starvation and mortality um, as food concentration becomes greater. We take the difference between birth and death rate, and that gives us little r, or instantaneous rate of, of population growth. Well, one thing you also can see from this graph, even though we don't really care uh, what kinds of food these are, they are very different. So the rate of population increase can be different on different food sources, meaning that there are different kinds of optimal food sources for uh, population growth of zooplankton organism, organisms. Now, um, the birth rate is temperature dependent, and that's simply because of development time. And we can look at two different graphs here. Here's the rate of development, which is um, one over the development time, and this is temperature. Rate of development increases for different kinds of organisms, including, um, a, a, including a variety of different kinds of rotifers. Uh, here's the development time and how it varies um, in, in this development time in days on the y-axis and temperature. And what I'd like you to see from this is that uh, it takes a very long time indeed for zooplankton to develop when it's cold. Um, and this is the effect of being a poikilotherm, whereas the development time tends to decrease very rapidly, comes down into a few days development time when temperatures are warm, or in, let's say, the spring or summertime. Um, quite a substantial uh, turnover of these organisms, and different organisms, and, uh, because uh, poikilotherms react in similar ways, uh, Cladocera and cyclopoids, calanoid copepods, tend to react in very similar ways. Now, the development time is shorter for rotifers because they're much smaller and there's less material to develop. So here's how summer population dynamics looks, and um, this is over from uh, over a scale from April through September. Um, here we have numbers uh, numbers of organisms on the top. Here we have birth and population growth rate birth this high peak here and this is little r 
and this is the predator population and the death rate here. Now we can start here. Uh, as the predators begin to increase, here's the dotted line, the death rate goes up very rapidly. So clearly mortality in uh, zooplankton can be great due to predation. Uh, in general, we see a uh, bimodal distribution of numbers of zooplankton um, as we move through the summer, often with a kind of a, um, um, an empty place, a sort of a low population uh, density in the middle of the summer, as things like food and nutrients might become limiting. Here we see the birth rate, and um, this is the uh, birth rate. Here's an uh, numbers have declined here. Birth rate comes up because of density dependent population dynamics, and the uh, R or the population growth rate tends to increase. Here we have zero population growth rate, and you can see that the population growth rate through the summer is um, uh, oscillating forth and back. Um, uh, between uh, between z uh, negative and positive population growth as that population waxes and wa as it increases and decreases. Here's what a seasonal biomass cycle looks like in one uh, temperate zone lake. This is in Sweden, in Zeerken, and um, we can see a couple of things. And this is again a panel from the new uh, Calf book. Here we see ice cover. Here we see the stratified uh, period in Erkin, the dashed line are the nanophytoplankton, um, and the um, and the solid line are the zooplankton. I think what you can see here, and I hope you can can read it on your screen, is that when the nanoplankton begin to grow after ice out, due to, as you know, increased radiation, probably increased nutrients, uh, increased temperature, the zooplankton uh, zooplankton react and grow in large numbers. This is actually not numbers, but biomasses. And then uh, the nano uh, zooplankton crash because they're being overgrazed. And in this case, they're being overgrazed by ciliates. And other groups of organisms come in and begin to grow. Now, the nanophytoplankton, because the zooplankton are well established and begin to grow, and we get a lot of first rotifers, then cladocera, and then copepods. The zooplankton become very abundant, and they hold that population of nanoplankton, nanophytoplankton, quite low for a lot of the season. Finally, in the fall, um, the phytoplankton can become very reduced due to very high um, grazing by the zooplankton. But then, as the temperature becomes colder and going down toward winter, the numbers of organisms decline over time. So that's kind of a typical seasonal biomass cycle for a temperate zone lake, and it varies. It varies among lakes, and the players, as you see down here, on sort of groups as a percentage uh, of the um, overall um, biomass, also will vary substantially among ecosystems. Here's um, also biomass variation over a series of years, uh, and this is again taken from the CALF. Uh, text and limnology, and what we see here um, are the temperatures in various years, um, and the number of fish there were a perch. Or there might be predators, um, and you can pick out a couple of trends. This is the density or the uh, biomass in um, um, in um, in sort of in, in milligrams per square meter. The darker colors are more. Biomass, and I think what you can see from this is when temperature gets extremely high, sometimes we don't get the very high biomasses of um, zooplankton uh, that we normally do. And and um, but in sort of average temperature years, we'll get substantial amounts of zooplankton, unless we have high high fish numbers. So there's always an interaction. There can be an interaction between temperature fluctuations. Um, uh, fish abundance and zooplankton abundance because the fish will tend to graze down um, the larger um, zooplankton. Another phenomenon that we see is diurnal vertical migration, and this is um, a moving upward and downward of, of uh, zooplankton populations in the water column with day. And here's an illustration from um, from the old Wetzel limnology text. And here we see uh, the um, 
the uh, the where Daphnia are found, sort of in the water column, um, in, in the shallowish waters, in the shallow waters, and you can see that um, the lots of Daphnia are in the shallow waters at uh, six, about six in the evening, and about six in the morning. They tend to be moving upward, um, and these here are the rates of vertical displacement. You can see them moving up quickly, see them moving up quickly, and then moving downward overnight. Uh, here we have light um, light abundance. This is a light level. This is, you can see it's getting dark. When it gets dark here, they're tending to, to move um, downward when it gets um, and uh, then move up just again uh, before dawn. And this is the rate of change in light level. And the thought is that uh, zooplankton react in, and migrate due to rates and change in um, it, rates of change in light level daily, um, and uh, I've I used to keep a, a big column of Daphnia in my laboratory uh, in Montreal years ago, and if I would turn on the lights or turn off the lights, I would get them to instantly change as a population and where they were in the water column. Turning on the lights, I would off if they're high in the water. I turn on the lights and they would drop to the bottom. And if they were then high in the water and the lights were on, I turn off the lights and they drop again. So they tend to react in vertical position due to light um, uh, light levels. And uh, this is thought there are a lot of suggestions for this um, for diurnal vertical migration. The explanations are things like energy savings, sort of being up in the water column when it's um, a little bit cooler. Um, the food sources, migration and movement of food sources, and also um, uh, migrating the, in a way that might um, help them avoid predation from visual predators uh, by being in the water column um, it, when it has become dark. The cues that have been suggested are things like light levels, changes in light levels, and various info uh, chemicals, things like caramones and various alarm substances. You also can cause um, cause um, organisms to change where they are, plankton organisms to change where they are in the water column. Now here we see contrasting the um, uh, position in the water column of uh, when fish are present versus absent. And when fish are present in the system, when it's light, um, the zooplankton tend to be at the bottom. And when it's dark, they tend to be up in the water column. Makes good sense. When fish are absent, they're up in the water column feeding virtually all of the time. That's from some experimental work. Horizontal migration is also pretty important and this is important in shallow lakes and um, here we have uh, the, um, the time of day on the x-axis and we have um, the individuals um, uh, within and with outside of uh, inside and outside macrophyte beds, uh, uh, plant beds in the littoral zone. Here we have uh, inside the macrophyte beds, uh, in the dark, um, the dark um, uh, symbols, and outside macrophyte beds as the light uh, symbols. So what we see here for Syria Daphnia is that they tend to be inside the macrophyte beds until it gets dark, and then tend to migrate outward into the open water. And we see, um, uh, uh, and you can see them coming up here in the open water. Bosmina a similar sort of pattern, and diaphanosoma, a similar kind of plankton. This is seen in shallow lakes. It tends to be stimulated by light cues. And the bigger planktonic organisms will move farther, not surprisingly, because they can move a lot faster. Horizontal distribution is also very different. And these are sort of star diagrams and a little bit hard, for, hard to read. Um, but what this does is characterizes the biodiversity, the different kinds of um, the different kinds of zooplankton organisms, and differences in shape of those stars up in the lake show you um, that there are diversely different kinds of organisms um, in different environments. Uh, for example, um, this um, this leg here is Polyphemus. It's seen a lot in the shallow zones. Um, this leg here is Eudioptimus gracilis. It's shown. It, it's found in the um, in the open part of the littoral zone and out in the middle of lakes. And some things like Daphnia cristata here in this very large leg 
are found in the deeper waters and um, different kinds of mixes of things like nauplii and copepidites, the different development stages of the zooplankton are often found in the uh, open waters in the uh, upper mixed zone. Zooplankton are also aggregated in space. They can form very dense swarms under cal calm conditions and um, some of these are so uh, dense that you can actually see disturbance on a calm lake surface by the aggregation of dense, uh, um, dense groups of zooplankton feeding. Also, f uh, there is a, a phenomenon called cyclomorphosis. So some um, zooplankton, especially Clodocera, actually change their body shape um, uh, depending on the time of year. And usually as a reaction, we think uh, to water temperature. And um, it may be also associated with high predation levels. Um, small individuals um, here are the first instar juveniles, and here are the adults. Um, it, occurs in, it occurs in temperate lakes um, and not really in tropical areas. It's, it seems to be triggered by temperature changes and maybe by turbulence and light and, and high predation levels. But you can see very uh, remarkable changes um, in, the, um, in the carapace shape of, of these Clodocera. Um, there, some people think that it also might have something to do with reduction of sinking because the more appendages you have sticking out, sort of the s more slowly you'll sink and the less energy you'll um, need to use in order to stay up in the water column. We might ask ourselves how much zooplankton there is in a lake and uh, the zooplankton abundance here shown on the y-axis tends to increase pretty dramatically and this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, with um, total phosphorus concentration. So again, the more eutrophic lakes tend to have more zooplankton in them, um, although there's a fair bit of variation. Uh, it's still a fairly strong relationship. More zooplankton in uh, more eutrophic lakes. Fish have an influence on zooplankton, and um, uh, here we see the average size of zooplankton, and this is the density of a uh, zooplanktivorous fish, and this is the ratio um, um, of a macro, a macro zooplankton, big zooplankton, to phytoplankton biomass here in various, um, uh, in, in various circumstances. First thing to see that where there are a lot of fish, the average size of zooplankton tends to be really small. And that's because the fish will eat the largest zooplankton first. When uh, there are few zooplanktivorous fish, this, uh, the size of the zooplankton can be very large. And sometimes this is used as a diagnostic tool to see what the level of zooplankton predation is on the zooplankton. Also, the ratio of um, zooplankton to phytoplankton biomass uh, tends to decline with increased numbers of fish. So um, that's because those zooplankton are being cropped away um, and, uh, and eaten by the fish so that there's sort of excess food available. Production is the rate of supply of food for other uh, trophic levels. And this is uh, from some work that I did in the past, also from the Calf Limnology book. This is the annual production in grams of dry weight per square meter per year. And this is the sort of mean annual standing biomass. So the more biomass we have, the greater the production. But this little curve here shows that as we get very high standing biomass, there's some kind of um, interference and the uh, production rate per unit body mass or biomass, it tends to be uh, lower. Z uh, oligotrophic systems with lower biomass tend to have higher rates or yields of uh, zooplankton biomass than do the eutrophic systems. So in conclusion then uh, for session 14, Clodocera, copepods, rotifers, and protozoa are really the main major groups of zooplankton, but there are also fish larvae, insects, and large crustaceans that play some role. These organisms eat small particles and they cycle materials very rapidly. And again, the old idea that little things do things faster per unit mass is an important one to remember. Zooplankton can clear all of the algae from a lake in a day, in fact sometimes many times in a day. And this has um, an important role in keeping waters clear and maintaining the clarity of water so that 
uh, phytoplankton are really not produced in excess. Zooplankton also have clear seasonal cycles and also daily cycles in where they are found um, and, uh, uh, and those are fairly reproducible and uh, important for the production and abundance of, of food for higher trophic levels. We learned about changes in body shape and cyclomorphosis and how they occur ever so briefly. Uh, but uh, And also we learned that zooplankton are most abundant in eutrophic lakes and lakes that have very few planktivores. Planktivores are those things that eat plankton. Zooplankton change their behavior and even their shape with prevailing conditions. Zooplankton are the important grazers and, and, um, and predators in aquatic ecosystems. Um, and uh, and are really important in cycling material and producing food for various trophic levels.